Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Pacwa and welcome to EWTN Live. We're bringing you guests from all over the world. If you are interested in the saints of the Catholic Church and the stories surrounding their lives, we've got a great show for you tonight. We'll be talking with a member of the Bolandist Society, which is the only institution dedicated exclusively to collecting, critically editing, and publishing texts on the lives of the saints. But before we get to that, we want to speak briefly with EWTN's Director of Online Services, Mr. Jeff Hahn, about what's new online. Jeff, what do you got for us? So, um, so as, as we've uh, redesigned the, our website, one of the sections that we've redesigned and the topic fits great with tonight's show is the Saint section. We've uh, been collecting since the um, late 90s over 450 saints mm -hmm. in there. So, um, so there's a, there's a, for us, a big catalog, nothing like your guest has, uh -oh. but- um, it, Yeah, it, but they started in 1643. They've got a head start on us, for sure. So, uh, so yeah, so we have a lot of biographies and, and a lot of saints out there, and we, my wife and I, we just had number eight, and we kind of like looked through the catalog for saint names. And so, um, so it's, it's something great to check out. Kids can check out if they have book reports or um, you want any type of, um, if, if it's the 450 that we have, you'll find some good information on it for sure. Yeah, and not only the biographies, but also pictures, and, and our, our religious catalog has a lot of things. They do. The religious saints. catalog has a lot of medals and books, the major works of, uh, you know, the doctors of the church. We, uh, we, we have those uh, medals. The sacramentals are very important. As well as in our, um, our, our um, library of documents, we have a lot of the public domain works, major works of the saints there that where people can, can get those things for free. Yeah, just download them from the, the exactly. website. Now, uh, this is important to me too because we live at a time when a lot of secular heroes are just being trashed. And we need heroes, but we'll be tempted to pick people who are not quite morally worthy of it. The saints are those heroes that we need and learning about them so we can imitate them and identify with them is a great thing. Exactly. Again, it's EWTN.com slash Catholicism slash Saints. Jeff, appreciate it. Thank you, Father. And we'll be back in just a couple minutes with tonight's guest who's been collecting Saints since 1643. Well, not she, but her friends. So stay with us. Thank you, thank you very much, and welcome back. Our guest tonight is a member of an independent group of researchers and preservationists that began its mission over 400 years ago to serve the glory of the saints by serving the truth and through the critical analysis of real facts, as well as seeing the legends and fictions of the saints in both Eastern and Western Christianity. Their work has been called the science of the saints, and it has proven to be a pivotal role, not just in the world of theology and faith, but in academic and cultural worlds, and for historians as well. Here to tell us more about it, please welcome 
Mrs. Irini de Saint Cernin. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for inviting me. And one of the things I like about this lady is that already she's correcting a bit of misinformation. It wasn't 1643, that was the first publication. When did the Bolandists start? We put our starting date in 1607. 1607. This is when Heribert Rosweid, a Jesuit, published his project about collecting and preserving all the original documents about the saints of life in a small booklet. And here's something very important, that this is a period of history when lots of accusation, this mm -hmm. is within uh, 70 years or, or a little bit less of the start of the Protestant Reformation. What well, is 70 years? Uh, yeah, 70 years. So, uh, you know, you, you've got, uh, you know, a lot of tensions and, you know, problems going on. And everybody wants to do more research. Mm -hmm. they, want to, they want to see. And so the, uh, these early Jesuits in 1607 were uh, started, well, I've got to do my math, so i to correct myself now, 90 years after the Reformation started. And um, this is where they are working on getting libraries going, Christian libraries, so we would have the raw information about the saints. Absolutely. This so, is what Roosevelt did. Actually, he witnessed in his lifetime the destruction of, uh, of churches in his land. And uh, he saw all the, all the uh, how things were going. He wanted to save the, the, the lives of the saints from the derision of the humanists and of the reformers. Mm -hmm. So he started, as you very well said, that was his motto, to save the life of the, serve the glory of the saints by serving the truth. And let us not forget, uh, Roosevelt was a Jesuit, so all that was done for the great, greater glory of God. Right. And it's a very important part of Jesuit spirituality to see ourselves as uh, servants and soldiers in the court of Christ the King. Absolutely. And when we take our first vows and our final vows, we include not only vowing to God, but we do so in the presence of the whole heavenly court, Our Lady, St. Mm -hmm. Joseph, and all the saints. Oh, so this is very important. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. The saints are like the stars of the mystical body of Christ. Yes. And we need them to guide us. Yes. So it is very important that we have factual, actual information. We need to know about their lives, about their struggles, about their triumphs, about you know, every, all the hurdles they, they, came, uh, they came across, and not only their legends, although the legend is also very, very important. Mm -hmm. And it's um, uh, something where uh, we can use the saints to better understand our own struggles, mm -hmm. that they were not people who floated around earth on clouds. It was not easy. No, no, they, yeah. they suffered a lot, had difficult lives, and they come from all walks of life. Absolutely, absolutely. We can identify much more. I mean, we can identify with them for sure. And we can also choose our favorite saint. Mm -hmm. We cannot choose many things in our churches, but we can certainly choose our favorite saint. And that's I think right. that's a very democratic approach. <laughs> and it's, uh, as I mentioned in talking to Jeff, we oftentimes see national heroes mm -hmm. attacked. Um, what was once popular, bravery and intellect with, uh, say, forming our American government and all these things, because they were not agreeable to some of the politically correct ideas today. They had faults, too. Mm -hmm. And so they get pushed away and rejected and pushed out of public life. The saints have another kind of testing by God and history that we need very much to have in our lives as heroes. And the saints, unfortunately, though, they are constantly liable to be compromised by what is written about them and what, what is said way? about how, them. How would they be compromised? Well, people want to do them honor. 
mm -hmm. hagiographers and we want to honor them. So sometimes we do not hesitate to attribute to them extraordinary, egregious feats and uh, which have never happened. But actually the truth about them is certainly much more powerful than anything legendary we can say about them. So this is what the Bolandists have done. They have always tried to find the historical figure under the coat of legend that mm -hmm. has covered a saint. And how do the Bolandists, well, first of all, what are the Bolandists named after? After um, Jean Bolland who was actually, Roosevelt passed away before being able to start his project, the one that he published in 1607. Mm -hmm. And uh, he left behind him a treasure trove of documents. And then a younger Jesuit came in and he understood the importance of this project and he asked to take it on. Uh, neither of them had understood the dimensions, the gigantic dimensions of this project. They right. thought that they would finish it during their lifetime, but obviously that was impossible. Because, uh, so, uh, matter of fact, you, it's, it's been going on since 1607, but you still have hundreds of, and, and how many more saints do you have to? Uh, well, we have 20 to, centuries to, of holiness. So yeah. I suppose our, our work uh, goes on as long as we believe that we stand to, to gain from knowing our past, from preserving it, from studying it, from, from understanding it, our mm -hmm. work has to go on, must yeah. go on. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So it's Jean Bolland who gave us his name. I see. So, so, so the Bolandist Society has been doing this since 1607. And when, uh, to, to go back to my question, uh, how do you separate the legend from the real? How, how do you approach that? Um, I suppose that they, I say I suppose because I'm not a Bollandist, I'm not a researcher, and unfortunately I'm not a historian. I simply represent them because they are not exactly self-publicists. They have a lot of work to do back home. So <laughs> What we might say is that they are church historical yeah, church. geeks. Yes, you can say that. That's exactly what they are. Probably, I mean, that's always been my impression that these are guys who are reading these ancient texts. Absolutely. They go through hundreds of documents until they identify what they believe and what they, what they, they try to find the most original of all these documents, the one which is closest to the truth. And sometimes it can take several years when you study different texts in, with scholarly skills, mm -hmm. and then you decide which one is the most, um, the, the, the most authentic one. Because, again, one of the other issues is a lot of the texts were handwritten That's for the saints problem. before the printing press. Absolutely. And there we have problems of, um, of copying. You can make so many mistakes, paleography, eye skipping, uh, missing, in, uh, missing words that you have to invent sometimes. Uh, and don't forget a problem that everybody has with m my writing bad penmanship. Ah, uh, well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is, I flunked penmanship four times. The four sisters tried. They just couldn't teach me. So this is uh, something that uh, they look at all these things and they have to analyze which the best manuscript and with some of the bad penmanship and sometimes tiny, tiny Absolutely. print. Yes. You know, they have to figure out what yes. it means. Translations also. Now, the director, who runs the Boland Society is Father Godding. Father Godding. Father yes. Robert Godding, SJ. Yes. And we've got a little clip uh, where he talks about uh, the importance of the hagiographic dossier. Yes. Uh, and this is not a fake dossier, this is a real one. So let's take a look at Father Godding's comments. For Boland, no document should be rejected. Every text tells us, brings us something. It can be about the saint himself. It can be also about the preoccupations of the author, of the, for example, of the monastic institution, which tries by rewriting the life of the saint to support some claims on possessions, territories, and so on. 
So the concept of dossier, of hagiographic dossier, is essential to the Bollandist enterprise. And you know, what, what they're doing with looking at these different uh, manuscripts, because for one thing, a lot of these are in languages no longer spoken. No. Or in dialects mm -hmm. of languages that are very, very old. I am trying to read some of the documents about Saint Venerable Bede, mm -hmm. you know, and these these are very old language things. So they have to know these languages and the dialects as well as the penmanship. It's it's just an incredible amount of research, isn't it? It's an extraordinary scholarship. We have um, we have had uh, scholars, Polandists who were experts on Oriental languages. Mm -hmm. So they would cover all the Oriental Christian um, uh, churches. And by, and by Oriental Christian churches, we're talking about the Syriac, Middle East, absolutely. Syria, Iraq, yes. Ethiopian, Ethiopia, uh, yes. Egypt, yes. Absolutely. Because in, even though that's North African. Yes. Uh, yes. They, they include all that in the Oriental churches and Armenian. Uh, and then we have all the Slavonic languages. Uh, after that, and then we have the Celtic. Uh, we had a Celtic expert as well. So because they have there, gone. There are a lot, lot of Irish saints. I mean, the Indeed. whole island used to be yes. called the island, the island of, of saints, saints and scholars. Absolutely, saints and scholars. Absolutely. Yeah. So we had all these individual scholars that have gone in depth, in a systematic way, and in depth analysis into all these documents. And they have published all their results either in the Acta Sanctorum or since 1882 in our scholarly journal, Analecta Bolandiana. Mm -hmm. And um, for the wider public today, um, the world has changed. We do run a Facebook page. So it oh, would good. be, yes, that we give some anecdotes and we give also some anecdotes about our library, mm -hmm. which is an extraordinary tool. We call it our laboratory. Uh, it is rich of, with 500,000 volumes and it is a unique, extraordinary place. Um, the biggest in its field in the world, really, a specialized library. Mm -hmm. So today, the Bollandists um, are asking for our help. Through them, we have come across all these hundreds of stories of saints that they would have been lost without their scholarship. But today, they need our help for their work to continue for the next hopefully 400 years. Yeah, it, this is something that is um, going to be very important because we, we see, in, even in the past, that the Bolandist library has been sacked by various opponents. Yes. You know, having something in a library is not often enough. Uh, it was attacked in the 1770s, correct? Well, in 1773, with the suppression of your order, uh, it was the first time that the, the library was pillaged. I mean, the suppression meant that all the belongings of the Jesuits on the continent, they were confiscated. Their property, their library, it was one of the most well-stocked libraries in the world with beautiful books. So most of them were taken away. And then they went through two moves, they had to move twice with whatever books there were left. Uh, then they went through the wrath of the, of, of, of the French Revolution. Um, so they were very, very difficult times. Um, and, and it's important to understand, you know, in the suppression of the Jesuits, this happened in, the, uh, there, there are two stages of it. The, uh, in fact, a lot of Masonic leaders mm -hmm. had gotten control of the governments of France, Portugal, and Spain. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want the Jesuits in their country. They wanted a more Masonic, rationalistic mm -hmm. kind of religion. And then the order was suppressed everywhere uh, uh, a couple of years later. And then the French Revolution was not many years later. And the French Revolution wanted to destroy totally. the history of the church. Absolutely. They, they wanted a purely rational. They saw the church as the origin of the Dark Ages. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to keep it in the dark. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and so they would destroy things. So it's not easy to have such a library, but 
You know, they just, this is what people of faith do. They keep coming back and getting back to what they can. And after the dust up with the atheists and such, we get right back to business and continue. They endure. We can say that 400 years later, they endure. Yes. And they go on doing the same work that they were doing uh, four centuries ago. Yeah, by the way, the French Revolution didn't do as well as we did. Going. <laughs> no, but um, continue, co continuing our research today in the times of fake news, fast news, all these Wikipedia pages, which are wonderful, but we could spend the rest of our lives correcting uh, whatever information we, find, we can find there on the saints. Mm -hmm. I think we need them. We need the Bollandists to assure the quality of information that goes out there. Uh, they're researching primary sources. So every historian who is going to write a good book about a saint, we must have access to some of our information. You see, this is one of the elements I, I was able to, I was really blessed last January to be invited to Rome to do a documentary on the Vatican Library. Itself, another one of the most important libraries in the mm. world. And this is part of the ministry of the church. If Jesus Christ is the truth, we have to be committed to the truth. Yes. And we have to investigate all of these truths. And, and see what's real and what's not. Absolutely. This is, uh, and the, the church does that. Uh, same with this, the papal archives. They used to be called the secret archives, but now it's called just the mm -hmm. apostolic archives. But these archives also preserve all these different ancient records. Yes. And this is part of the church's mission. Absolutely. And all of us have to be involved in the preservation mm -hmm. of truth. And our work has a real impact. In 1969, the Canon of Saints was revised by Pope Paul VI, right. based on the work of the Bollandists, because he wanted the devotion of the faithful to be based on, on, on real historical facts rather than simple legends. And, and it's, that's an important point because some people say, well, the Catholic Church got rid of St. Christa. They didn't like him anymore. That wasn't what happened, was it? No. It's not that they didn't like him. No. Uh, well, St. Christopher, you know much more about his file than I do, for sure. Well, I, 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 I could just say briefly that, you know... We have he, a record of his death in an early martyrology. The problem is that all the legends we know about them, they were produced, all the information was uh, produced about him, goes to the 8th century after that. So... And he lived in which century? Third, we believe. So, so between his death in the 200s AD until the first stories about him, it's 600 years, we can't verify it. We cannot verify that. That's, that's, so it, that's the question. It's yes. not that we got rid of him. He no. said we didn't demote him. No. We no. just don't know enough about his... We, the Bolandists could not find concrete contemporary information. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> and they're not going to stop. And, no. You know, the, but, and if they do, they'll publish it. Absolutely. Absolutely. This but, is a, a very important element. Um, you know, they're, they're not against the saints. No, no, the Bollandist approach was always constructive. We must always remember that. It was not a question of separating saints into fake and real. It would be too simplistic for a 400-year-old scholarship. It was really trying to go to the root, trying to understand uh, what everything, when everything started, what was the real person, the real personality, the real historical personality of the saint. Exactly. We have a little bit, a video clip again of Father Robert uh, Godding uh, explaining the hagiography's importance to the wider world. How, why this work is important for not only the church's spiritual life, but also for the academic life. The study of hagiography is of great importance, both for church history and for general history. 
for church history. We Christians profess that we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Theologians will tell you that the church is holy because it's the body of Christ and so on. But I think the church cannot be holy if you don't have holy people at every generation. Without saints, the church would just be a mere structure, an institution. Saints are those who, accepting to surrender to the action of the Holy Spirit, give their whole life and with intelligence and with the inspiration of the Spirit, respond to the challenges of their time, give an, a translation, we can say, of the Gospel uh, adapted to their own time. So it's absolutely essential uh, for the Church. But hagiography has its place also in general history. Saints are individuals, historical persons who had often a great influence, who had a very original, meaningful life. And the documents which relate their lives are just historical documents, historical sources. And it happens that in some periods our only sources are just lives of saints. Like, for example, in Merovingian times, 6th, 7th century, well, we have almost no other sources than lives of saints. So, if you want to study any topic, like food, clothes, ideas, mentalities, well, you just have to read the lives of the saints. In fact, that's one of the things I like to do for understanding church history. Mm -hmm. A lot of people find history kind of boring because hist history books, especially in the schools, are boring. They can be, yes. Yes. Whereas when you read the lives of the saints, Definitely. you see the events that they're part of history. Absolutely. And these events unfold and you start to see, oh, this is how mm -hmm. Napoleon affected mm -hmm. some of the saints like Josephine Natelli mm -hmm. and others. Mm -hmm. You know, you see where they're part of that and you begin to pull together history better by reading these lives of the saints. Both the uh, historical and the legends. Absolutely. Both they have their, their space. Yep. Because through the legends, very often um, we have a window in the hearts and the minds of the people of that time and place mm -hmm. that we wouldn't have in any other way. Yep. Uh, as Father Godding said very well, uh, most of the time it's the only information we can have about a place or a time um, in, in the medieval ages. Uh, it comes through the life of a saint. Yeah. This is very important. And not only about the church, but also about art, about uh, economy, about medicine, um, the way they eat, yeah. uh, the way they, they dress, everything is there. Everything yeah. is in the lives of the saints. That's so. a good thing. We have to take a little bit of a break. If you have some questions for Irini about the Bolandist society and about some of the saints, including if you want to ask more about some of the saints who are no longer on the calendar, they weren't demoted just aren't on the calendar. Uh, you can call in and ask about that. Our phone number is 1-800-221-9460. 1-800-221-9460. If you are outside North America, then you have to call country code 1, area code 205, Two seven one two nine eight zero. So one two zero five two seven one two nine eight zero, and uh, we will put you to the head of the line if you call from out of town or out of the country. So please stay with us, and we look forward to your questions and those of our studio audience.
Now, we want to give people some information about the Bolandist Society. Um, you can go to learn more about them on the internet. Uh, they are called, uh, it's Bolandists. Now, let me spell that because they don't put it in the English way. So we'll just go along with the, these folks. It's B O L L A N D I S T E S. So B O L L A N D I S T E S dot org. But the website is in English. Well, uh, the website's in English. They just didn't do an English name. That's all right. We can cope with that. But uh, yeah, it's a Bolandist. Dot org, And then they have a Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash Bolandists. So it's the same spelling, B-O-L-L-A-N-D-I-S-T-E-S. -L -L -E and you can find out more, and, and uh, we'll, we'll talk more about them in a little bit as the show goes on. Let's start off with some questions first. Uh, let's start off with Thomas. Thomas, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine, Father. How about you? Fine, thank you. And what is your question? I have a question for Miss Serini. Why in 1969 was the Saints calendar changed? In other words, some feast days remained the same and others were changed. Why did that happen in 69? I think it was the decision of um, uh, Pope Paul VI yes. to revise the Roman martyrology. Right. And uh, it, it was um, some of the saints were not given anymore the universal, they were not proposed as a universal cult. They were allowed right. uh, a more local cult. Uh, but that was his idea was simply to, to revise it according to more to the canons of critical historiography. And I think some of the saints were a bit more popular that there were uh, some of the, there, there are a couple things that happened Thomas too um, the calendar changed under Pope Gregory that's why we had the Gregorian calendar and when they did that in the Catholic countries first they sort of skipped two weeks mm -hmm. And they changed some of the feast days because I think it was St. Teresa of Avila died on the uh, fourth, third or fourth of October, but that was the same day that the calendar changed. So her feast day was on the 14th. And some of the other saints, their death days were different than their feast days, okay. so they were adjusting those. Yes, they were those, adjusting to that. They right? were adjusting to the day, new date. So, yes. Right, and and then um, they're also getting some saints who just are, are, are more local interest. Mm -hmm. So we, we see in the United States that we have a number of American saints now. Which are uh, wonderful, the first absolutely. First one was canonized, I think, when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Now there are more of them, and so, but they don't celebrate those in Europe. No, no. They and don't. some of the European saints, we don't celebrate here. Absolutely. So that mm -hmm. that's that's some of that was all readjusted mm -hmm. as to who would be more prominent for in the universal church or for the local church. Exactly. Absolutely. You know, like for instance, a lot of people don't know, but. Um, Saint Abraham and Saint David mm -hmm. and Saint Sarah, they all have feast days, but it's in the calendar for the Holy Land. Okay. And so they, they, they have their own feast days. Uh, and they're, they're churches of mm -hmm. uh, some of these saints, but they're not on the universal calendar, they're local saints. <laughs> well, just happens to be the Holy Land is local. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from Alabama, lower Alabama, down near the Gulf of Mexico. That's what we call L.A. L.A. That's right. That's All right. Lower Alabama. And by the way, I understand from our conversation that today's your birthday? Yes, it is. Oh, happy happy birthday. birthday. Thank you. Yeah, some days I'll, you know, you'll catch up to my age. 
So what is, uh, what is uh, your question? I guess I missed this, and I, I'd like to know where you are from and where your organization is located. No, you're very right. I think I forgot to you try didn't, to mention it. You didn't it. miss it. Oh, we didn't say it. <laughs> we didn't say it. So you don't, don't let anybody say that because it's your birthday you're forgetting <laughs> stuff. Sure. You were just right on. So We are based in Brussels in the middle of Brussels, oh. in a superb library dated, uh, dating from 1905. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they were always on Belgian territory, well, since it became Belgium before yeah. we were in the 1830s, so we're always there. And, uh, and before that, it was, it was not in Brussels. It was, it in, was in Antwerp. The Provost House was in Antwerp when, uh, in, when, when, in, uh, when it started. Uh, then it was the suppression, though, so they had to move down to a, to a monastery in Brussels. Then they had to move with the Premostratensian brothers of Tongerlo, who sheltered them uh, until the French Revolution. And that was when the, the work Start, uh, where the work stopped for about 40 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Until they it. started after that in Brussels in 1837. And also, uh, partly for uh, Thomas's question last time, you know, it was Pope Paul VI who got a congregation for the causes of, of the, the saints. saints. Absolutely. And that, that was one of the things he did to make, to mm -hmm. look over this process of which mm -hmm. saints are on the universal calendar mm -hmm. and, and not. And uh, again, based on the work of the based Bolandists, the work of the if they didn't have contemporary data about a saint, but only later legends like St. Christopher, they moved them off the universal calendar. Doesn't mean they didn't exist. Right? It, it, yes, it means that the legend has to be separated and we should still look for, for the historical exactly. personality. But we were always on great terms with the popes. The popes always appreciated the scholarly rigor of the Bollandists. Yes. And we have been encouraged uh, on various occasions. And the last one was by Pope Benedict the Sixteenth mm -hmm. when he congratulated the Bollandists for their 400th anniversary, yes. and he wished for the work to see the work go forward and encourage them to apply the same strict, rigorous um, uh, canons of critical historiography to their research. And in, in fact, one of the problems that the Bolandist had or has is during the reign of Pope St. John Paul, he canonized more saints in his pontificate than I think in the previous 500 years combined. That's why we need the support for us to go on. Right? <laughs> yeah, really. I mean, if these popes are doing that. I mean, Pope Francis uh, is already got 893 uh, saints, uh, including the 813 from Otranto. From the martyrs. The martyrs. So, yes. so yeah. the, there's there's about 5,000 new causes. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we're hoping one of them will be Archbishop Sheen. So uh, you know, get that cause moving. So uh, these are um, great research that's going on, and they just keep giving you all more work. Well, in the, somebody actually sat down in 1840, and he counted all the saintly persons mentioned in our Acta Sanctorum, mm -hmm. the 67 volumes of Acta Sanctorum, and he came up with 25,000. 25,000? 25,000 that they had done research on. That's extraordinary. That they is. studied in depth 6,200 saints, but actually they had to go through um, the stories of 25,000 that either they had to move to other dates or they had to maybe downgrade or you know simply save their cult but they did not have much information so that's an extraordinary research really scientific research Absolutely. for the church it's an extraordinary service to the church and to our society a lot of people don't think of it as scientific but it really is it is yeah, it very is much so. it is and it's very important so I have another question from our studio audience ma'am where are you from Philadelphia that's fine. Good to have you here. Um, what is like the most interesting thing you've learned about a saint? And who's your favorite saint? Um, my favorite saint, it has to be St. Basil the Great 
fourth century bishop, bishop of Caesarea. Um, so, and that's Caesarea in Asia, in Asia Minor. Minor. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I. The Caesars like to have towns named after them, and if you want a brownie points with the emperor. You just named a city after him and he would be nice to you. Well, probably that was the case as well. But he's my favorite saint because of his extraordinary family. Um, his uh, grandmother was a saint. His parents were saints. His three siblings were saints. He was an extraordinary um, uh, erudite because he went to, to study Greek philosophy mm -hmm. um, and uh, from, from through the Greek philosophy understanding also Christianity a superb liturgy, the great liturgy of St. Basil, uh, but also of his legend, because his legend uh, warns that when the Roman emperor levied a very heavy tax on his people, uh, St. Basil ma managed to persuade him to give all their little goods they had to scrap for and give to him back to them. The problem is how do you restitute all this property back to his rightful owner? So he baked a huge cake into which he hid all the valuables and after saying mass, he distributed a piece to everybody present there. And each person was restituted with what he had given for paying the tax to the emperor, which uh -huh. I find absolutely extraordinary as yeah. a story. And it has given uh, his name to, since then we bake a very delicious cake to his honor once a year and we do enjoy it. Yeah, this is, and that's a Greek custom to it's make this cake. It's a Greek custom, absolutely. Yes. Well, the, you got to start off with the fact that the Greeks are wonderful cooks to begin with. <laughs> and we like so, our sweet things, yes. Uh, well, well, the rest of your food, too. And so uh, when you get to dessert, that's going to be extra special. Absolutely. Yeah, yes. and so this, because that's your homeland is, is Greek. I'm you were, Greek, You yes. uh, were born in Greece. Raised in Greece. Raised there. But now you are working in Belgium yes. and traveling the world. Um, this is a, a very important thing. And, you know, one of the nice things about having a favorite saint and favorite stories about saints, that can change over time as, you know, life has different needs and you come across different interests. Mm -hmm. You know, you have career saints, like St. Luke for doctors, mm -hmm. and St. Thomas More for lawyers, and um, St. Matthew for tax collectors, and accountants. Um, you know, so uh, every, when tax collectors get a patron saint, just so long as you keep in mind, he's also the patron saint of alcoholics. I don't know how that's connected, but <laughs> but that's one of the things. As your needs change, you have different favorite saints. Yes, well, we come across extraordinary stories and characters. Um, um, the other day, I was talking in Washington with a, a, a sister from the Sacred Heart congregation, and one cannot cannot help thinking of Saint Philippine Duchesne and traveling. Right from Bordeaux to Louisiana at times uh, much, much more uh, difficult than uh, what I will have to go through the airport tomorrow. So right. I'm, I'm sure to remember her yeah. <laughs> if I'm not, if I don't feel very comfortable in the lounge and yeah. <laughs> to think what she has gone through. Exactly. Yeah. The, the travel when they came over on sailing ships was yeah. a lot more difficult. Certainly. And, you know, the the being able to relate to some of these saints and learn from them. Um, this is why we develop a prayer life that includes them. We seek not only their example, and we try to study their lives to see how they're just like us mm -hmm. in so many ways. And we need their help and intercession. And their, their prayer for us is important. Mm -hmm. I'd like to use this example from the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. In Revelation chapter 5, you see the 24 elders around the throne of God. And they, are, they all have harps, and they have golden bowls 
full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints on earth. So for the, the church here mm -hmm. on earth, our prayers are like nuggets of incense. And being Greek, you know incense, you know, we, we know it, that incense nuggets smell good. Yes, they do. But when you put them on fire, mm -hmm. the aroma is released mm -hmm. and it's more, it fills a room. Mm -hmm. And the saints take our prayers that are like these nuggets of incense in this big bowl that they all have, and they put them on fire before the throne of God. They release the aroma and the adoration to God mm -hmm. of our prayers. That's why we seek their intercession. Yes. And I noticed that you have a, a holy hour of prayer on Sunday, invoking the saints at yeah, the chapel here. Absolutely. Yes. absolutely. So it shows how relevant they are and how important in our daily life. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, this is uh, something that we also have relics of saints. Now, you don't deal with many relics at the Bolinda Society. We do you? are asked from time to time to give our um, expertise about their authenticity. Okay. But um, not that often. I mean, our, our expertise is often seeked uh, out by, by dioceses or by sinful people who want to know a little bit more um, about their favorite saint or um, they came across an icon. So this is a, you know, a, a little side, if you want, a line of... Yeah. We try to, to, to give as much service as possible outside our scholarly But the, the idea of having these relics is something that uh, goes back to the Bible mm -hmm. when the prophet Elisha had been buried and they were another group of people were burying somebody else and there was a raid from some Bedouins. So they just took his body and threw it into the open grave of the prophet Elisha and it says in 2 Kings chapter 13, mm -hmm. as soon as he hit Elisha's bones, he came back to life. And then we mm -hmm. see in the New Testament that they would have aprons and claws they would touch to. So that's why we have, you know, third class relics third as class well relics. as first class yes. and second class. Yes. So these are um, things that are very, very uh, important for, for to see. Pardon? Well. For channeling devotion. Exactly, exactly. And, uh, you know, and in many uh, Eastern churches, mm -hmm. uh, icons are part of that as well. Icons are very important for Absolutely. us. Relics are very important for us. Yes. Um, that's why sometimes when we, we Orthodox, um, we hear about St. Nicola of Mira yes. for us, but it's now for you St. Nicola of Bari because his relics were stolen yes. in the 11th century. It shows how important they were, how well, important the, it was to be possessed by well, other churches. As a matter of fact, a lot of times, uh, especially the Italians who were sailing and doing business all over the Mediterranean would, uh, some would say steal, some would say rescue uh, relics from some of the uh, Muslim countries. You know, uh, so St. Nicholas had been taken from Asia Minor after the Turkish mm -hmm. invasions. That's true. And they didn't give it to the Greeks, they brought it to Italy. Uh, so they're, they're little funny business yes. in, in their, their idea of rescuing. Uh, same happened to St. Mark from Alexandria after the Muslim conquest of Alexandria. So, you know, the, but that's been one of the nice things in modern times. Some of the popes are saying, eh, you can have the real estate. have it. This wasn't very nice. Yeah. It, was, it was a sort of a rescue, but kind of a theft. So there's a lot of exchange back, and Absolutely. hopefully yes. that'll build up some... Bridges uh, between, even bridges. more bridges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. A little more respect. A little more respect. You know, the, the work of the Bolandists is still ongoing. And we want to encourage people to be generous to them. 
you'll we be, need your if head. you do that, you'll be preserving these ancient documents, historical records, and helping scholars make sense out of them from a very important, one of the most important libraries in Europe. Mm -hmm. So this is a very, very important thing. It is thing. a very laborious job. Oh, yeah. Um, quite That's hard. why you need geeks. Yes. Well, we uh, need exactly, geeks. we need the, the Bolandist geeks, you're right. <laughs> it is a very laborious job that they have undertaken through their love of the church yeah. and our Christian tradition. So yeah. your help, our help, uh, will encourage them to go on. And let, let me just give a place where they can go. It's, again, Bolandists, B-O-L-L-A-N-D-I-S-T-E-S, Bolandists.org slash support dash us, yes. support dash us. And it's, it really is worthy. I, after 400 Thank years plus yes. of doing this great work with plenty more to do, we need your support. Thank you. And I'd like to give a blessing to everybody uh, for being with us. May God bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and lead all of you in all of your ways by his peace, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And, you know, it's a great generosity on the part of so, so many American Catholics that make this network possible and informing people about things going on in the church and we appreciate it and just ask you to continue the ongoing support in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill. We have a lot of our bills, too. And we're, we're always appreciative of your help and prayers. God bless you.